morning, church. I'm so thankful that you have joined us online. I'm Pastor Jen, one of the pastors here, and I'm happy to be able to welcome you today. Stay connected by going to our website. You're going to find all the links that you need to, to give and also find out information or be able to sign up for some of the things that are coming up. A couple things I want to point out to you. Word Alive, we have begun our week 11, which is book two. It looks like this. So if you don't have your book two, you can get those outside our office doors or you can request one on our website. Also coming up is drive through Nativity. This has been a tradition of Church of the Savior for years and years, and we are going to be continuing that tradition. But of course, it's going to look a little different. So we want you to make sure you go on our website and find the link for you to sign up because we are still going to need all of you to volunteer and to dress up and to be a part of this gift that we give to the community. And so make sure you are a part of it this year. So look for that link. Today is Communion Sunday, where we will also be able to recognize and honor the saints of our church. So make sure you find in your home some crackers or bread or some juice and bring that to your worship space. So when it comes time in our worship service to celebrate communion together as one body, you are prepared. And with all of that, let us enter into the space for worship. Welcome today to a service of reformation. Change is our constant companion. What does God have in store for us? God seeks to form our lives anew as lives of love and service. We are ready to hear God's word and do God's will. Open your eyes, your ears, your hearts to God's awesome love. We come seeking the Lord's transformation in our lives. join me in the opening prayer. Open our eyes, Lord, as we worship. Help us to see Jesus as he reaches out to heal our blindness. Help us to let go of all those things that keep us in darkness. This day, as your word is proclaimed, let our hearts and souls respond with joy, transform and reform our lives to do your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We live in a fallen world. Believers and unbelievers are both inundated with the consequences of sin. Our God is not indifferent. God is not uncaring. The consequences that afflict us which as we know go in waves from time to time, are allowed to do something internally within. They will either strengthen us in our faith and life in God or repel us. The story of Job is much the same. 
Throughout the story, Job holds tightly to God and does not lose faith, although he had many questions throughout. Ultimately, God blesses Job and restores what he lost and renewed his spiritual life. Hear Job's repentance from chapter 42. Then Job answered the Lord, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Hear, and I will speak. I will question you, and you declare to me. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. A few years back, I was in San Antonio, Texas at a festival. Now don't get too excited. It wasn't what you're thinking when you hear the word festival. You think booths with games and fried food and churros and bright colors, party atmosphere. Well, remove those thoughts because the festival that I was attending was a festival of homiletics. What is that? Well, Festival of Homiletics is a week-long party of preaching, one preacher after another. I mean, don't you all wish you were me? But, but it really, it was sermon after sermon on a wide, wide variety of topics and styles and backgrounds. There were some well-known preachers, and then there were some others that were given the opportunity to preach, people that I hadn't heard of. But for a preacher, being at a festival of preachers, well, it was exciting. I was able to go one-on-one -on -one with some really awesome people that I've admired for years. Well, one of the preachers is one that I've mentioned here before, and I love her writings. I have several of her books, and her name's Barbara Brown Taylor. And when I can find uh, her speaking on a podcast, I always want to listen in because she's just a great speaker. Well, I was sitting in one afternoon session, and I was soaking in her words. But then I grabbed my pen, and I started writing. And I know that she's articulated this in other ways and other times, but here's what she said that day. These are her words. Whenever you come up upon something about God, the gospel, or the life of faith that everyone knows is true, step back from the crowd whose gaze is fixed on it and look in the opposite direction. Because nine times out of ten, there is something just as true back there though largely ignored because its benefits are less obvious and its truth harder to embrace. She kept preaching, but I stopped listening. But this was eye-opening for me. Whenever you come up on something about God, the gospel, or the life of faith that everyone knows is true, Step back from the crowd whose gaze is fixed on it and look in the opposite direction because nine times out of ten, there is something just as true back there. And it's truth harder to embrace. Here's what that might mean. Take the phrase, God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. That truth is so central for us as Christians. God is light. God is light, and in him there is no darkness. I mean, I'm sure you're singing the hymn right now. In him there is no darkness at all. The night and the day are both alike. The Lamb is the light of the city of God. Shine in my heart, Lord Jesus. I mean, that's a central truth. God is light. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. This is a truth. I know my life has depended on this truth for as long as I can remember. But what happens when I turn around and see only darkness? Is God there? When the bottom is pulled out from under us and we are falling into the abyss, is God's hand present, ready to catch us? Is God in the darkness? 
without you waiting to the end of the sermon, I'm going to answer that question right now. Yes. Yes. As much as we claim God is light and in him there is no darkness, the opposite is as much of a truth. We just don't sing about it. God dwells in the deep darkness. God comes to us in the darkness. And as Barbara Brown Taylor has said many times before, God actually does some of God's best work in darkness. But we don't want to spend any time in darkness. We use darkness as a way to describe difficult seasons of our lives. I mean, I know when the time comes for me to explain, and maybe you as well, 2020 to my grandchildren, I am certain that I'm going to say things like, it was a dark time in our world. I will describe the season that we are experiencing using words like heavy and unsettling and, and a time of tension, a storm that never seemed to pass or to end. But is God's hand not here? Is God not working? Is God not present? When I look back on some of the difficult seasons of my life, you know, the loss of my father, miscarriages, a loved one incarcerated, loved ones in rehab, a breakup of a longtime boyfriend. I will describe them as dark times, difficult, dark seasons. But what is also interesting to me, now that I'm past all of those seasons, standing in the middle of darkness, if I would have turned around and looked the other way, I would see God's light. Because whenever you come up on something about God, the gospel, or the life of faith that everyone knows is true, step back. Step back and look in the opposite direction. Because nine times out of ten, there is something just as true back there. And it's truth harder to embrace. But who of us wants to ask God to send darkness? Not me. I mean, when I fall on my face in prayer, like, like Jeremiah, I am crying out, Lord, I am looking for the light. Lord, send me the balm of Gilead. Come bring healing to my soul. I want to get out of this dark valley as quickly as possible. And yet, we can't miss this today. In the dark valley, when we are standing in the middle of a storm cloud, God is there. Because God is in the darkness as much as God is in light. So today we come to this amazing story of a man named Job. I mean Job. Try convincing kids that you pronounce it Job. No, it's Job. Well, once you get the pronouncement of his name correct, Job did not have it easy. And this week, our reading, week 11 of Word of Alive, I mean, we turn to this new book, book two, and, and you turn to week 11, and at the top it says, suffering. So we start reading, and in a single day, Job lost everything. Job goes from having it all to having nothing. Job had lost the people he loved. Every child he had perished in a single calamity. His own painful experience that followed, however, must have paled in comparison to those lessons. The grief and the pain was so severe. So walking through the 42 chapters of Job, the question we continue to ask is, is God in the suffering? Is God only in the good? The story of Job explores the difficult question of God's relationship to human suffering, and it invites us to trust God's wisdom and character. Set during a, an unknown time period in an obscure land far from Israel, the book of Job focuses on questions about God's justice and why good people suffer. It also asks the question we rarely think to ask. Why do good people prosper? Look in the opposite direction because nine times out of ten, there is something back there just as true. And it's truth harder to embrace. There's a lot that is difficult to swallow in the book of Job. His road to the most important encounter he'd ever have had was paved with heavy grief and sorrow. I mean, we hear from Job's wife and his friends, and they speculate as to why he is an upright, why an upright man is suffering. And Job accuses God of being unjust and not operating the world according to principles of justice. And his friends believe that Job sinned and caused this suffering. 
Well, let's take a look at just the beginning. Job chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. There, there once was a man named Job who lived in the land of Uz, and he was blameless, a man of complete integrity. He feared God and stayed away from evil. He had seven sons and three daughters. He owned 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camel and 500 teams of oxen and 500 female donkeys. He also had many servants. He was, in fact, the richest person in that entire area. Job's sons would take turns preparing feasts in their homes, and they would also invite the three sisters to celebrate with them. When the celebrations ended, sometimes after several days, Job would purify his children. He would get up early in the morning and offer a burnt offering for each of them. For Job said to himself, Perhaps my children have sinned and have cursed God in their hearts. This was Job's regular practice. So this is the guy that we're introduced to. To. And in our eyes, we would have said, wow, he's a good man. And so he deserves all this wealth and this good fortune. Of course, all would be well. He is a righteous, godly man. But the sto story takes a turn. And so our truth, good people, good blessings, well, it's called into question. Because in one fast swoop, his animal, animals, house, servants, kids, all gone. Job has nothing. And then, for the next 35 chapters, there's this debate or this dialogue between Job and his wife and his friends, a debate on suffering. And in this debate, Job had one question. Should we accept only good things from the hand of God and never anything bad? Well, this dialogue that pours out on, on the pages of Scripture, well, None of them answer Job's questions, but this back and forth, not answering the questions that goes on chapter after chapter, and then when Job finally gets a chance to speak, he speaks as a changed and humbled man. No longer does, does Job demand an answer from God. No longer does he insist that his righteousness wasn't deserving of suffering. God reminds him, that the world has order, sure, and it has beauty. But God also tells them that the wor world is, is wild and dangerous. While we don't always know why we suffer, we can bring our pain and grief to God and trust that God is still with us. The end of Job's journey left him surprised by a one-on-one -on -one encounter with the living God. Listen in on Job's final thoughts. Job 42, starting at the first verse. Then Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do all things. No plan of yours can be thwarted. You asked, who is this that obscures my counsel without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. You said, listen now, and I will speak. I will question you, and you shall never answer me. My ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. When God himself came to Job and spoke and took the initiative to make himself known to Job, Job had a new kind of encounter with God, and his eyes were open. Job now had a new sense of God's reality. It, it is more than intellectual or speculative knowledge. It is a knowledge of the heart. Now my eyes have seen you. Job's eyes were opened, and before jo Job saw God in, in this way, he had esteemed himself as, as somewhat highly uh, you know, and righteous and had not hesitated to assert his righteousness. Now he sees himself more clearly. And what he sees drives him to repentance. That's what happens when you really see God. It happened to Isaiah. Woe, woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King and the Lord of hosts. It happened to Peter when Jesus showed his power. Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. It happened to the centurion when Jesus came to his house. Lord, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have come for, for you to come under my roof. Job's eyes were open. And what Job realized is the power of God, the power of God in the good and in the suffering. 
He had this encounter. And when people meet God in the Bible, it's, there's no one's laughing. No one's taking it lightly. No one thinks that it's something routine. All of it seems to connect to this early proverb in, in Proverbs where it says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Job's eyes were opened. God is so powerful. And when we grasp the power of God, we're just like Job. All of our questions, all of our complaints, all of our priorities melt into sheer awe. The book of Job is this nonstop dialogue until it's time for Job to react to God. And at that moment, Job responds, My ears have heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. And after that moment, Job's silent. After all the words in the previous chapter, there isn't another word recorded from his lips. Seeing God and understanding God's power changed Job's entire perspective. But I want to go back to Job's question. Should we accept only good things from the hand of God and never anything bad? Job's friends couldn't accept the bad. As just, something, as just something that happened. They couldn't accept that. Job's friends could not wrap their heads around a good man having endured all this bad stuff. There had to be a reason. But this question from Job speaks to one of our truths. As we stand in awe of the goodness and blessings of God, when we turn around and look in the opposite direction, can't we still see God's goodness and blessing? Job began in the light, this righteous and blessed, blameless man, but suddenly now he's standing in the darkness and everyone assumes he is fallen and broken and full of darkness. But it was in the darkness that God moved. When Job saw the approaching clouds, the Lord spoke to him from a storm. And from what we read, and there's hints from Elihu's comments, it must have been a, an impressive set of clouds, complete with lightning and thunder and, and rolling thunder. It would have been a massive show of force. But in this force, God was there. The storm clouds rolled in, and we cry out, Why, God? Why all this darkness? Take it away. But what we see in Job is the cloud... And God's glory, they match up. Job yelled into the darkness and God snatched him up into a whirlwind and showed him things too wonderful for him. God dwells, friends, in the darkness. When God rolled in in the storm clouds, Job wasn't hurt, he wasn't injured, and wasn't silenced. In fact, not long after this dialogue, this conversation with God, this interaction with God, in the epilogue of Job 42, we read that Job is blessed. Children, proper, pro property, and wealth. His prestige, his integrity, honor restored. He died old and full of years. Should we accept only good things from the hand of God? And never anything bad? Is God only light? Or is God darkness as well? I get it. None of us want to be in darkness. None of us want to walk the life journey of Job. What happened to Job is terrible. He suffered a great deal. And yes, he lived a long life afterwards and life was restored, but it doesn't replace the children lost. It doesn't replace the pain that he experienced. It doesn't take it away. None of us want to walk through darkness, and yet, think about the dark times of your life. How have those dark seasons changed you? How does it change walking in a dark season knowing that when you're sitting in darkness, thinking, oh, I must have done something wrong, or, or God is a pun punish me, punishing me, or, or God's abandoned me, to know and as an absolute truth that in my darkness, no matter what, God is there. How does that change things for you? For me, it saves me. That might be the one thing that carries me through. None of us can check a, a box that guarantees a, a dark, cloud-free life. And sure, there are dark clouds of my life that I wish I've ne I never had to walk through. 
But knowing and, and even at times experiencing God's full and glorious presence is in the storms, okay, I can walk through it. I can walk through light and I can walk through darkness because God is there. Go back to all that we've read thus far. God shows up in darkness. He came to Abraham in the dark and Jacob in the darkness, the thick of night at the river bank. The exodus happened at night, manna from heaven at night. Moses and the people camped at Mount Sinai and God said, I'm going to come to you in a dense cloud. All this to say, the clouds, darkness, God dwells where God rests. God's home. I could have written a thousand endings, different endings to all my dark stories. I'm sure you could write different endings for yours as well. But if I were to rewrite them, all of my endings would have placed me at the center or controlling life or my outcomes, which means God wouldn't have carried me or comforted me or empowered me or wept with me or sat with me or redeemed me. God is light, but God is darkness as well. Amen. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Almighty God, Creator of heaven and earth, God of Abraham and Sarah, God of Miriam and Moses, God of Joshua and Deborah, God of Ruth and David, God of the priests and the prophets, God of Mary and Joseph, God of the apostles and the martyrs, God of our mothers and fathers, God of our children to all generation. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join in their unending hymn. Holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death and resurrection, you gave birth to your church and delivered us from slavery to sin and death and made us with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself, up for, gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of, your, of these holy, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice and union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of our faith. 
Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. Renew our communion with all your saints, especially those whom we name before you. Terry Madama. Terry Price. Nita Roberts. William Vandemark. And finally, we remember those loved ones we hold in our hearts today who are no longer with us. Since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, strengthen us to run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Now we join in the prayer that he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us. For this is thy kingdom and thy power. Amen. And now this is, we come to this moment where we invite you to the table. Whatever space you might find yourself in, know that God is with you. And God invites you to take bread and juice and make it one with you. As he did with his disciples, he said, This is my body broken for you and my blood poured out for you. So take a moment and share that communion with our Lord this day. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this gift of being able to come to your table and to share a meal with you. Thank you, Father, for sending us your Son, the sacrifice that was made on that Christ, the cross so that we might have new life. We might understand grace. We might know your mercy. So, Lord, just pour over all of us in this moment and in this day. It is in your name that we pray. Amen. It's good to be in worship each week. God also cares just as much about what we do in every other hour of the week. We are partners with God and with one another in our ministry at Church of the Savior. Our giving is one way that we practice what we teach. Let us gather our gifts together and offer them in, to God in gratitude and praise.
Join me in our prayer of dedication. Loving Father, we humbly dedicate these tithes and offerings to your use. Allow this money to become a resource that lifts the shadows of despair from the recesses of people's lives. We recognize that only you can restore faith to the faithless, hope to the hopeless, and love to the loveless. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. darkness tries to roll over my bones when sorrow comes to steal the joy I own when brokenness and pain is all I know I won't be shaken I won't be shaken my fear doesn't stand a chance when Darkness has been banished. Sight has been restored. Your lives are reformed in Christ's love. Go now in peace to serve with great joy. Bring the love of God with you so that the light which has reformed and brightened your life may shine for others. Go now, beloved, to serve. Thank you for joining us today, and I look forward to seeing you next week. Amen. <laughs>